Now we want to talk about a wonderful and exciting topic, and it is called neuroplasticity. The one or the other might have heard about it before, and since it is one of the greatest topics of neuroscience in the outgoing 20th and starting 21st century, I can only give you like an overview, and therefore I called it neuroplasticity in a nutshell. And we neurologists, we like to compare the brain either to avocados, because it's so soft, our brain, or we like to compare to walnuts, because the structure is similar. So this is the idea, neuroplasticity in a nutshell. Now, from early on, humanity knew that by training, your muscles grow. So, even in ancient Greece, in the Olympic Games, they knew you have to train hard and then your muscles start growing and then you run faster and you jump higher and you jump longer and you throw the spear farther and it's all great. But does exercise or training not only have an impact on your muscles but also have an impact on your brain? I mean, does your head start growing when you train? Probably not so much, but what happens to the brain then? I think Paul was much more advanced in his time because he said he compared our spiritual life with the ancient Greek Olympic Games and he said fight the good fight of muscles. No, <coughs> fight the good fight of faith implying when you do this your brain is impacted. And spirituality is something you can learn and something that can grow. Faith can grow. So this is a wonderful news. However, it hasn't always been that way and we come to that later. But first we want to start with a definition and I hope you can read it. I will say it anyways. Neuroplasticity describes the brain's ability to change. That's it. Neuroplasticity describes the brain's ability to change itself and in regard to its function, structure, at every level of organization, a whole life long, and as a response to everything we do or experience. Now let me explain quickly what all these different terms mean. By structure of the brain or nervous system, I mean a modification of specific brain regions, genesis of new neural pathways, genesis of new synapses, new neural fibers, or even new brain cells. By function, we mean an increased impulse rate, of example, for example, of a synapse or other neuron connection. And it happens at every level of organization. That means from the smallest molecule up to the highest developed brain system, neuroplasticity is impacting you and your brain. And it takes place a whole life long, from birth even unto death, so that even a centenary, he can change his brain. And it happens as a response to everything we do or experience. What exciting news or what fearful news, because it can happen either for good or for bad. So let's go into a little bit into history, because in history the dogma prevailed in the neurosciences that your brain is kind of a rigid substance. Of course, in babyhood and in childhood, it is malleable, it can change a little bit, but as soon as you grow older, like you are now, um, it cannot change anymore, it's kind of hard stuff, and um, if you try to change it, it may get even damaged. So we can compare this to some clay. You have the soft clay and you put it into a shape and it's malleable and you can form it in one way or the other, it's wonderful, but it's, as soon as it is being put into the oven and heated and cooled down, it's, it's rigid and when you try to change it, it just smashes. 
So this was the idea for actually centuries. People believed your brain is not able to really change in adulthood. Now, let's continue. We study phrenology. There was a famous German neuroanatomist by the name of Franz Josef Gall. And he thought, well, he was a very good observer and he went to school like most of us, I think. And he went to school in a, at a very early age and he looked at his neighbor and his neighbor, he had this peculiar skull shape. It looked really fascinating. And as he was a very good observer, he quickly noticed that his neighbor in, in the class, his class neighbor, he, he was very smart. And, and he had these protruding eyes and this wonderful skull shape. So he thought maybe all people having protruding eyes and a weird skull shape might be very intelligent. So I hope all of you have protruding eyes and you are very intelligent. No, you kind of seem to see that this is not the solution to neuroplasticity. So you cannot infer from the skull shape of your of the person sitting next to you, you cannot infer her or his intelligence. So this doesn't work. So we have to go further. And we come to cortical localization. And we have Pierre Paul Broca. He was a French physician and Karl Wernicke, a German pathologist. And they studied the brain of dead people. And they noticed that in people who had um, experienced a stroke, when they were doing then the investigation of the dead brain, they found like that certain areas of the brain were damaged, which were not in those people who died in health. So they thought, well, maybe different regions of the brain, different lobes might have different functions. But then it got even further. We come to Corbin Jan Brotmann, another German neuroanatomist, and he did brain mapping. That is even more um, sophisticated because he didn't only do it in a big view, but he went and looked at the microscope. And then he looked like at the different cells, how they were structured, and he tried to find out what brain region is responsible for which activity. And then there was the Canadian neurosurgeon. He even went, it, went one step further and he did all this in a vague brain surgeries. So he took his electrode and put it into his patient while the same was awake. And he asked him, well, what do you feel now if I place my electrode here? And then he said, well, my, my, my left hand is getting numb now. Or he said, well, I don't feel my left cheek anymore. Or he said, now um, I'm, I don't know what. So, and then the last sen um, concept is sensoric substitution. I will unfortunately quit over that. It would be much, way too much to go into this now and probably yeah, let's continue. So the new insights of neuroscience if I've put out is neurons that fire together, wire together. This was the new idea proposed by Hepp and which was confirmed through several scientists after him and neurons that fire apart, wire apart. Now neurons or nerve cells, they do something which other cells in the body just don't do as much. They like to work together, or they don't like to work together. So that's interesting. The second thing is neurons that are trained become more efficient and process faster. So we don't only have the idea that new neurons can be created as, new, as we call it neurogenesis, but also we have the idea that neurons can work faster through training. And then neural neuronal structure in itself can be changed by experience and training. And this is where new start sets in. I think you're very well familiar with this concept, so I can quit over this. And another one on exercise, Dr. Daniel Binos uh, already talked about that. A lack of exercise, did you know that, is as harmful as smoking and obesity. 
Now, it's not only all about the question, do you smoke or do you not smoke? Do you drink alcohol, yes or no? Or are you obese or not? But do you move? Do you move your brain? Do you move your body? Because if you don't, it's like smoking and obesity. So we should conclude everyone teaching or living a healthy lifestyle should embrace moderate exercise as one of its irreplaceable elements. Now, it's interesting, I want to make a proposal here that most of or even all of the new start points, they work through our blood system. Because blood is so important, as even Ellen White pointed out. It is on the one hand securing our circulation and by this oxygenation, metabolism and detoxification, it is regulating our body, regulating temperature, regulating pH, and it is also involved in protection because in the blood we have all the system of wound healing and the immune system. And then it goes even further to the molecular, cellular, structural, functional and behavioral level. I have to skim over these, but what they found out in several experiments now is that indeed the brain can grow through neuroplasticity. That means if you practice something, for example, you do your um, training, your exercise, then several molecules, they are increased cellular activity is increased and structural and functional it's even interesting to see that your brain can really kind of grow like i mean not your skull but the brain itself the the gray matter and the white matter it's it's very interesting and in the behavioral sense which is i think the main conclusion of neuroplasticity is that our behavior can be changed and our cognitive and sensory motor performance increased. Now we have problems today, right? In society and all over the world, we have brain pathologies. So let's go through them. One of the problems we have with our brains is learned non-use. Like, how many of you are right-handed? How many of the right-handers can brush their teeth with the left hand? Okay, how many can cut their nails with the left hand? Yeah. Okay, even, even less. You see, this is learned non-use. The way God made your body, you are able, it's no joke, to move every single toe individually. Did you know that? So you can actually play the piano with your feet, the way God made your body but you don't, so that this just shows that you have learned non-usage. You just don't do it. Then we have the problem of dementia, which is also a bigger and bigger problem, because in the cities we have all this bad air and this is increasing dementia, we don't get sleep, which is also increasing dementia. And then we have the noisy brain. I like kind of this concept. This means like, you want to learn in your study room and the neighbor is vacuum cleaning the floor and then the, the, the garbage is being transported away and then you suddenly get a cell phone call. What about your learning experience? It's just not working. It's gone. It's the noisy brain. Because other brain regions like the auditory cortex or the visual cortex, they are so much involved in processing information that you just can't read your book anymore. And it is not only the case that we have heart dysrhythmias, but there can only also be brain dysrhythmias. And as I've already pointed out, neurons like to work together. Now, what are the stages of healing? What does that mean? What does neuroplasticity mean for a practical life? We have on the one hand, at the first step, the correction of general cellular function of glia and neurons through the blood-brain barrier and the glymphatic system and this is now interesting. I, have, I, I think I need more time. <laughs> but um, the blood-brain barrier, we already talked about the importance of pure blood, right? And now this blood has to go through, has to get into the brain because the brain also needs the oxygen and needs the nutrients and needs some other stuff. This is on the one hand side. So the blood-brain barrier shall make it's possible for the good blood to go in and for the bad blood to go out, right? Detoxification. 
And this is now very interesting, because in science we know for a long time that in the body for detoxification we have the lymphatic system. But in the brain they never found a lymphatic system. So how does the brain detox? How does it get rid of its waste products? Now you can say it does it through the blood. Well, that's nice, but how does it do it between the cells where there are no blood vessels? Now, a new system was discovered just some years ago, and it's called the glymphatic system. So this is kind of a merger between the glial cells of the nervous system and the lymphatic system idea of the body. And this is a system which is, call, which is causing a water flux, so this means it just moves water from one side of the arteries to the other side of the van, van, veins, and thus through this water waste products can be eliminated in between the brain cells. Now have a guess. What waste products are being eliminated through the glymphatic system? You sensed right, it's the a beta protein which is accumulated in Alzheimer's disease. So we really need this system. And what do you think? When is this system at its best? At what time of the day? In the night. Right. That is why you need your sleep. Because you don't want to get dementia, right? So this is really a serious issue. And they also found out the position or the way you sleep impacts the effect of this glymphatic system. So if you are sleeping on the side, it's working better than you're sleeping on the back. And the second, we have the neurostimulation. They found out that in stroke patients, stroke patients, they just lose their possibility to work or to, to uh, move automatically. When I now are moving up and down the stage. It's all automatic. I don't have to think about my right feet, I don't have to think about my left feet, and even if one foot is in the air, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. All my brain and my system has learned to cope with this through automa automatized processes. But when you have a stroke, the brain suddenly dislearns this. And, for example, if you have a left hemisphere lesion, you cannot move your right hand anymore. So you have to learn it again. And this is possible through neuroplasticity. But it has to happen through neurostimulation. Because if you don't use the paretic, the paretic arm or hand, it is just getting worse. So you have to use it. But the problem is, the healthy side, it kind of kicks down the, the diseased side. So there are several therapies, how you, what you can do. And one is constraint-induced therapy that you can do. And that means you take the healthy arm and bind it into a glass, put it into a glass, and then the stroke patient has to use the sick hand to do, for example, handwriting or, or actually in the beginning take something into his hand. And he cannot use his healthy hand, right? Because it's in the glove. And therefore, the brain is forced to use the sick hand. And this works. Not in all cases, but in many cases. And the stroke victim learns to use his right hand again. We have neuro neuromodulation the reticular arousal system and the autonomic nervous system. It's very important. We have to see that we really need relaxation. This is the next step. That's the sleep hygiene, as I pointed out, and the glymphatic system. And then neurodifferentiation and learning can take part. It's the last step. So we have to go through all these other steps in order to make sure that we are learning properly with attention and focus and differentiation. Because how many of you are musicians? How many of you play the piano? How do you play a difficult piece? How do you learn it? Do you? Yes, you have to play slowly, 
Right, that is differentiated action. You have to do it slowly. And if it's still too difficult, what do you do? You just take one hand. And if it's a triller, you may only be using two fingers. And you use them so long, and you train so long, uh, until you are able to perform the triller. And then you move back to one hand, two hands, and in the end, you start playing faster and faster and faster until you are the next Mozart. <laughs> so, let's, I'm all my, almost done. I wanna have, I wanna give you the ideal exercise prescription for the brain, not only for the body. The ideal exercise prescription is you should do, be doing aerobic exercise, that means in the fresh air, outside, Every day in moderate intensity, and one example would be sport or power walking, it's called 30 minutes a day. Would be very good for our brains and would be very good in prevention of dementia, as we've pointed out. Now let's um, close with a Bible text I pondered about in the past. Um, Revelation 14.1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, in the Greek language, the, the word for forehead means met hopon. Now, this can mean either between your eyes, so the seal of God is placed between the eyes, or you can say it is placed behind the eyes. So this brings us back to brain science. So even in the Bible, in the ceiling, we have the idea that our brain is able to change and that our brain is able to reflect the divine image. And when this has happened, through the working of the Holy Spirit in and through us, this brain can be sealed. It's not a mark on your forehead. It's like a brain that is totally committed to the Lord. And this one can be sealed. Who of you wants to have this brain wholly committed to the Lord and learning to trust him better and better every day. Amen. Thank you.